Now, one thing I've been kind of wanting to do for a while, and, and I think I'm going to have to revisit this because I'm not really happy how this turned out. But the idea is not to explain to you exactly what happens, because if I knew exactly what happened, you'd probably never see my fat ass again. Now, let me just back up a second here and tell you where I'm coming from. I like reading old, old books on the markets, especially old books that discuss technical analysis and psychology more than anything. And I love them when they kind of walk you through a bull and a bear market cycle. And they tell you about what happens and how the sentiment of all the players change. And it really helps you to wrap your head around reading some of these things as far as how markets actually work. And it kind of reassures you you're trading traders and not markets. And it's the sentiment of the market that matters. And you can't really measure sentiment, okay? Even though some people think you can, you can't. Anyway, so I love reading those old books where they explain how the euphoria sets in and then people buy stocks at any prices and then the market crashes and all the things that happen in between. So I just got to thinking like, how could I explain this maybe through like an IPO? So an IPO comes public and remember we're trading traders, not market. So all these little people in the background or traders or potential traders or investors, if you uh, are also investors possibly too. And when a stock first comes public, let's say it's a really crazy go-go stock, it goes straight up. Well, you might have the early adopters. You could have some people that were pre-IPO investors. And we'll talk about those guys a little bit in a second, but if they were fortunate enough, like in this case, to get the, the stock pre-market, pre-IPO, then they make some deals to not dump it on the market right away. Otherwise, they'll never get another IPO. Anyway, so early adopters, and this could be people that are playing a theme. You know, Rivian comes to mind with this, or however you say it. I just call it RIVN. But it went straight up when it first came public, and the excitement was, hey, it's electric cars, okay? It's going to be the next Tesla is probably what these people were thinking. And then the FOMO kicks in, and a lot of the FOMO – has these FOMO fear fueled traders jumping in the market. And if it sets up just right, maybe maybe we're doing a buy at B. And, and John and I were just talking about IPOs uh, before we went live. And John's here tonight. He's a resident IPO expert in the group. And we were talking about just various things that we haven't seen a whole lot of IPOs lately. And I, I want to talk a little bit about that in a minute or two. But anyway, buy at B is one of the patterns that John really likes and talks about quite a bit. And what, one of the good things about IPOs is that, as we were talking about pre-market, pre-show, I should say, is that the rules are fairly well defined. So anyway, without going off too far on a tangent, it could be some of us going in here as buy at B traders. Now, when it gets really, really frothy at this level, a lot of the fickle Johnny come latelys come in. And they'll buy at any price and they have very little staying power and they're also very emotional traders and you could get a lot of selling by these guys early on and sometimes that could be the straw that breaks the camel's back as people often say a bull market ends when the last person buys right now as the stock begins to slide, the people who missed out on the first run might start looking to buy it. Some shorts might pile on. And again, it's impossible to explain or know what all the players are, but just know that there's a lot of players. And also know that the players are changing. Now, let's say it rallies out of a pullback, then we might go after it as a core trend trade, kind of more like the core methodology, a TKO or a pullback, or maybe like a Landry Light pullback to 30 EMA or something like that might occur. And we may or may not hit the initial profit target and we might just flat out stop out. You know, it happens, right? And as this thing begins to drop, more and more and more and more and more people are at a loss, provided, of course, they're still holding 
the stock, okay? And you might have some of these early adopters or let's say the pre-IPO people are chomping at the bit to bail out as soon as they're allowed. So that could be some pent up demand coming into the market, could exacerbate the slide. Shorts might start coming in and piling on and that could actually create some pent up buying. But initially shorts harm the market or can harm the market. And then it might just start trading all over the place, right? And at this point, it's everybody left that's still in debating whether to get in and out of the stock. And as I preach, people sell stocks for a variety of reasons. They have, when they have money, they buy them. When they sell, they sell stocks when they need them. And others use more sophisticated methods. And that's Marion McClellan's quote, Tom McClellan's late mother Marion said that quote, everybody uses, uses timing in their investing. So you never know what happens when these consolidations happen. And it could be just everyone else fighting it out. And it could be day traders coming in. It could be a bunch of people coming in. And maybe some people looking for, to hold on for dear life. And at some point, if it's got enough volume, maybe some institutional interest. The point I'm trying to make here is that the makeup of the traders changes. And the personality of the stock is made up by the people who are trading it. Okay. And again, we're trading traders, not markets. So ideally you wanna recognize when something has changed. If you were long back here, or let's say you came in and did day trade or day trades every day, and this thing's going up 10 points a day, and you're making 10 points a day and feeling like a genius, then all of a sudden it starts to implode. If you can't short, you're trying to fight this short-term trend, okay? And then eventually you might end up in a crazy market like this. And this same little thing that I'm showing here on a daily chart might be playing out intraday. So things change, obviously. And that's one of the problems with, but it was working so well. Now, as far as you changing, that's gonna be a hard one to figure out, but it could have something to do with your career outside of trading. And I'm friendly with some of you guys and some days you're trading like madmen. And then other days you're nowhere to be found. And it's like, oh, well, I was busy. I had to work that day or I had to do this or whatever. So for better or for worse, that, that could affect your trading, obviously. And if work is not going so well or you're under some kind of pressure or whatever, and you always are under some kind of pressure, right? Then that could certainly affect your trading. Lack of sleep. I get it really, really, really early which means everyone else isn't necessarily on my schedule as far as going to bed. <laughs> you might've drank too much the night before. You could have a fight with your spouse or significant other or, or both. As I, as I say, if you have a fight with both, or if you have both, you might not want to be trading. You got enough problems to deal with. And one thing that I've talked about over and over again is that your trading spills into your life and your life spills into your trading. And it can end up quite cyclical and self-perpetuating, okay? I'll go first. I'll have a really shitty day. I kind of wear my feelings on my sleeves. My wife doesn't like me to be in a bad mood. It's okay for her to be in a bad mood, but I'm not allowed to be in a bad mood. So if I'm in a bad mood, then she gets into a bad mood. And next thing you know, we're both in a bad mood. And then the next day I come in and it's kind of like, rrr, rrr, you know, and so... <laughs> It could, it could really be self-perpetuating. All right, so as far as the pain management, and I'm just scratching the surface here. I, uh, number one, of course, as I said earlier, make sure earlier, make sure you have fully accepted the risk of a trade going into that trade, and that's gonna help you a lot. It's a hard business. I don't want to make it look like it's easy. And, and I watch a lot of these crypto videos lately. And a lot of these crypto videos are by these young punks that don't understand trading. And, and I had a long reply for one guy today and I accidentally deleted it and realized that maybe I'm just wasting my time. But he was saying, don't buy things when they're going up. And I'm like, oh my God, you know? And he's like, buy them when they're, buy them when they're going down, buy them when they're low. I'm like, oh God, this is just an idiot. <laughs> but it, it, it is a hard business, it, it, but it's not le nearly as hard as you try to make it. And I'm, I'm guilty of that too. 
if you just follow a longer term or methodology or short or in my case a short to intermediate term methodology it's fairly cut and dry and as i preach sometimes it's almost boring there's a lot of other things that you could do to create these self-inflicted wounds over trade and into wishing oh damn it i said i'd try to do a webinar without saying that into wishing versus intuition which is uh ed sakota quote and a lot of us create our own misery present company included right i'm not holding them now one thing you need to do is recognize and embrace mistakes and maybe learn something from them and then make sure you're fully accepting of your methodology as i've said ten thousand times i've had people come in when i'm printing money and they think this is the greatest thing ever and tell the boss to go f off or quit a profitable business in one case i know this couple had a very profitable business they're like why are we wasting our time in this very profitable business when we could just work an hour or so a day and do these trades and i tried to talk them out of quitting and i don't know whatever happened to them i'd be willing to bet they had to restart their business because a bad cycle came along but if you could live through a few of these cycles and take the good with the bad don't let the good go in your head go to your head right my best clients come in when things are kind of rocky win a little lose a little win a little lose a little and they're like okay this isn't that easy but i could see where it sometimes works and then all of a sudden bam we hit the cover off the ball and they feel really good like, okay I, I get it now but you do have to go through a few of those cycles good bad and different and you know what's what's crazy is the the pain of of mistakes the pain of a choppy market the pain of a sharp reversal or whatever else when these positions go against you you would think if, after you've been doing this for 30 years that you'd be like oh okay that's just that's just normal it's like but no you still feel the same emotions and and one you know from a psychological standpoint when you experience something and i've talked about this ad nauseum too but let's say you experience something that's aggravating and you kind of lose your shit it's not that one little thing in and of itself and i've given examples before like like my wife lost her her shit with my daughter because she told her to give the dogs water and she told her over and over and she's like if you don't give the dogs water tonight you're not going to go on that fun little bus trip tomorrow and she's like oh yeah i'll do it in a little while and she never did it and my wife kind of blew up a little bit i blow up a lot too so it's not just her but it wasn't that one little forgetting to give the dog water right because she does that every day it was the everyone that's ever happened so i think it was douglas that said talked about that so the pain of a losing trade has a lot of other losing trades connected to it and it's complicated right i know it's pretty easy on the surface but it can be complicated not as complicated as we try to make it but it's still pretty complicated so you have to fully accept your methodology understand it good bad and indifferent i see people go out and do things the same day i i, I teach a pattern and it's like no i, I you know as I say, find a hundred examples and more importantly, play a little devil's advocate, find out when it just flat out doesn't work. Don't wing it. I mean, we're all guilty of this on occasion. It's fun to wing it sometimes. And be super careful of S and G trades. Sometimes we talk about S and G trades to bars options expiration. I'll probably fire off some gamma plays where i see an option that i think is cheap and can't believe that they would sell it to me that cheap okay and at the end of the day when it expires worthless now i know why they sold it to me that cheap they took my money and i'll just have to be cognizant of that and, and maybe play it a smaller way i know you can't get a little bit pregnant and one thing I'm guilty of too is trading not to lose. And I have to recognize that as I go to do it. And this is this is this isn't within the core methodology. This is when I'm doing something like an intraday trade or an ETF or possibly a stock. I'll see one of you guys in and out of a stock doing really well. And I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go in because I'll just risk a half a point and we'll see what happens. And then guess what? I lose a half a point. And a lot of times when you're trying to just lose a little bit, okay you end up losing a lot more because by the time you get your orders in or whatever, it gets away from you. So make sure you are trading to win when it really looks like a good time to trade as opposed to trading not to lose. 
Now, one thing I'm a huge advocate of is morning pages. And I've talked about this quite a bit, so I won't bore you too much, I promise. But if you wake up every day and write three handwritten pages, you're gonna learn a lot about yourself, a lot about your business, a lot about trading, a lot about what's happening in the world. And if you keep making the same mistakes over and over and keep writing about them over and over, you become a bit of Einstein's definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. Now, when you do make a painful mistake, did you really just do that once or did you do that a bunch of times in the past? It was, um, what's the guy's name? He wrote principles. He had a pretty bad drawdown. Hopefully there was nothing, hopefully he didn't um, lose his discipline, but in principles, what's this guy's name? Um, I'll have it in post, starts with a D. It escapes me. But uh, anyway, he wrote that if they come across a situation where something goes wrong, they document it and it becomes another one of those. And if you keep having another one of those, eventually you need to come up with a rule for that. OK, uh, another one of those I'm guilty of. I get really busy with life, trading, business and now crypto or whatever else is, is, is happening. Go look although crypto has cooled off, obviously. And I'll forget that it's a Fed day, okay? And I'll be long or short S&P futures going into Fed announcement. And I feel like, well, I'll do that once, you know? And that needs to be another one of those. I need to ask myself, hey, is it Wednesday Fed day? Or maybe have some commitment device, maybe on Fed days or a week ahead of time, put a sticky note, Wednesday is Fed day, you moron. <laughs> Now, I realize I just kind of scratched the surface there, and this is something that we definitely will revisit. And I'm a nerd, I'm looking forward to revisiting it 